Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus. This is episode 171 and I am the show's host Kyle. On this episode of the show, I'm going to be discussing the heroic Ahed Tamimi, who is a young Palestinian who has uh, been suffering and now imprisoned by the Israeli government. And her trial has just concluded, so I want to get into that and what it means and just what the system of justice looks like in Israel, especially for young Palestinians. For those of you who want to share the show to get the news out there to more people, and especially I had story because it's really important. And uh, the, the more people that are exposed to this, this is one of those things where uh, people could really start to stand up and demand justice here. So foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com and libertarianinstitute.org. All right, so I, I guess I mean the story of Ahed Tamimi goes back years as far as her resistance to the Israeli state, but it really became an international news when, in late 2017, a situation unfolded on her family's property where Israeli defense forces came onto the property and, after an altercation, ended up shooting her 15-year-old cousin. Uh, he was shot in the face with a rubber bullet. Uh, he was in a coma for quite a while after this, and I, I kind of lost track of his story, so I'm not sure uh, how that young man is doing. But after this happened, I, I guess I had started to uh, scream at the Israeli soldiers and uh, confront them and attempt to get them to leave her family's property. Cameras start rolling, and they capture the images of this young girl uh, slapping and pushing uh, the Israeli soldiers back and off of her family's property. Uh, the soldiers, I guess, in some way, to their credit, didn't, you know, shoot her in the face, which I'm sure if they had, they probably wouldn't have faced uh, any serious consequences. I mean, something like that captured on video may have been so bad that, uh, that you know, they would have had to face some kind of reprimand and, you know, sit on desk duty for a while. But at the same time, uh, and as I'll discuss later in this show, the Israeli defense forces really aren't held all that accountable for their actions against the Israeli or the Palestinian people. So the soldiers don't do anything, I guess, are eventually backed off and leave her property. Now, the, the reaction to this, uh, I found very interesting, uh, because uh, th there's a lot of optics going on here. One, you have, you know, this very brave girl standing up to the Israeli troops and uh, this could be some kind of symbolism for the Palestinian people that if you stand strong and stand together, you know, maybe something good will happen. I believe eventually, like, her mother and her aunt were kind of, like, flanking her as uh, she went after these soldiers. And so, uh, you know, some groups, and uh, I think rightfully so, have portrayed Ahed as somewhat of a, you know, kind of feminist and outstanding young woman here who... Uh, is standing up to the imp uh, oppressors who are, you know, <laughs> these six foot tall, uh, fully, you know, masked. They, you, you can only see their eyes in, in full gear holding M4s or M16s. Uh, you know, these full grown men who are standing over this girl and, you know, who could come on her family's property and could shoot her cousin in the face and then leave. And, and here's her standing up to them. And, and so I'm sure that was a pretty powerful message. But at the same time, one of the, the criticisms that Israel faces here is that they're too tough and, and they're too cruel and too heavy handed on the Palestinian people. And so in this video, you also have an example of the fact that the soldiers, you know, didn't hit her with the butt of their rifle or didn't uh, likewise shoot her in the face or something like that. However, yeah, the, the reaction from the Israeli side is, you know, to demand the arrest of Ahed and say that, you know, she committed a crime and assaulted this Israeli soldier and that maybe the soldiers, had, you know, showed too much restraint and at the very least should have arrested this girl. And so I, I'm surprised I have to do this, but I see it all the time and I haven't seen like a ton of articles about it, but the, you know, the comment sections and the discussions you have on social media, people are defending the actions of the Israeli state here, and they are saying it was wrong to arrest and charge Ahed for this crime, or it was right of them to do so. Yeah, it was wrong for Ahed to confront them, and she was an aggressor and you know assaulted the officers and is 100% guilty. So I guess, I mean, I don't know how more clear to make it than to say the narrative, but remember that this is the soldiers coming onto her family's property, assaulting one of her family members, and then you know, refusing to leave her property until she confronted them and removed them off their property. I think by, le you know, at least uh, the libertarian capitalist standards of property rights, uh, she was certainly well within her, her rights to confront the soldiers in this way. Not that I would advocate for it, but I think she could have, you know, used the force necessary to 
get them to leave. So, I, I mean, I think that's kind of cut and clear where the morality on the issue is that a head didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have bro- broken any acceptable version of the law and to call what's happening to her as, you know, justice or law and order is an absolute joke and mockery of the terms. I want to talk a little bit about the Tamimi family uh, because it is a pretty important family to the Palestinian movement, especially it seems to me as far as, uh, you know, kind of activist protism, like actually protesting and actually going on the ground and, uh, you know, going out and doing some rallies. Uh, there's a documentary that I believe Veterans for Peace just put out, and I'll link to it in the show notes page. It's 40 minutes long, so it's not super long. Uh, well worth your time. Uh, Matthew Ho, Chris Smiley, Ray McGovern, among others, travel to the West Bank and kind of just stand alongside this Palestinian family as they're attacked by settlers to the West Bank and Israeli troops. One of the videos shown in that documentary is actually a few years old, but it's of a younger Ahed Tamimi standing up for one of her younger relatives who was being uh, tackled and pinned down by an uh, Israeli soldier. Again, you know, the soldier completely face covered, you know, full gear, has a gun strapped around him. And this kid, you know, nine, ten years old with one arm in a cast. Anybody who watches that video, I mean, I guess they could, you know, people will say, oh, the, the, you know, soldier was doing what he was trained to do as far as apprehending that kid. But it's clear to, you know, anybody who's a f- full grown man and wants to be honest about it knows that that soldier was using an unnecessary amount of force on a young child that he could have easily handled in a way that wasn't so aggressive. Uh, that soldier was, uh, tackled and, uh, I had jumped on his back and tried to free her cousin or, uh, I forget what he, he, what kind of relative he was. And then was, I think, assisted by maybe her aunt or, uh, another older woman relative. And so, um, you know, th- this is the kind of thing that apparently this, uh, you know, young woman likes to do, which, it seems completely crazy to, you know, be, be willing to stand up to such a heavily armed soldier, but, you know, she, she's been shown to be willing to do that, I suppose. I want to update real quick on Ahed's cousin. One of the nice things about doing a podcast is I could pause and go uh, chat to make sure I'm getting things right. Her 15 year old cousin was shot on December 15th by the Israeli soldier the, the day I had stood up to them, uh, and he was in a coma. Part of his skull was removed. Uh, he was subsequently ar- uh, arrested in February after making a recovery. Uh, a kid with, you know, if you look at a picture of him, you could tell his skull has been removed. And I will be sure to link to an article about his captivity in the show notes page. Uh, but he has been arrested, and I don't know if he has since been released, but he was at least arrested by the Israeli Defense Forces. And so, you know, I guess this is just another clear example that the Israeli justice system is, is injustice at all. I, I mean, this kid is obviously the victim <laughs> of an attack by the soldier, and then the soldiers later arrest him. All right, to get back to the story, uh, Ahed's story, she remained in jail for several months awaiting trial. She was uh, not allowed to go out on bail, and in fact was going to be, tr- uh, uh, was tried in a military prison, or in a military jail, in a, a military court. It seems unbelievable that you wouldn't let a uh, young girl who's, you know, 16, uh, turned 17 years old while in jail, who simply slapped a soldier, uh, get out of jail. It, it's not like, you know, this is somebody who actually poses a severe threat, you know, and they, they charged her with assault. And so the, you know, she could have absolutely been let out on bail. It's not, you know, like there was some kind of threat here, but they, they force her to remain in jail. And one of the big issues, I guess, leading up to the trial is that the uh, defense is asking for an open trial. They're saying, hey, we want this out in the public. And I'm sure one of their arguments is that if this trial is out in uh, the public, then the court will have to be accountable to the people. And, the you know, the, the idea that the international community would see this and be able to evaluate the injustice going on here and demand Israel and the court do the right thing in this situation. However, uh, a first court and then a second appeals court denied Ahed's right to have a public trial and would force the trial to go about 
in, in a private setting. Uh, the court, of course, said that this was for the benefit of the child who, I guess, didn't know what she was signing on to asking for a public trial. And we, you know, just want to hide her shame. We don't, we don't want this out there for everybody to see. After the second uh, trial, or after the second appeal, I guess, was rejected, I had then accepted an eight-month plea deal. And this is kind of why I see, you know, the conclusion of the trial. And she is going to spend eight months, although with time served, at least, uh, you know, thankfully, she got that much. Uh, so from, you know, once she was arrested in December, eight months, so late July, I suppose she will be released. Now, I guess the first thing I want to talk about, and, and this not only applies to Israel, but the United States, but the idea that these plea deals are some kind of fair agreement between those accused and the prosecution in which justice is somehow negotiated the two, between the two parties and served. What happens here is that people are arrested for crimes, uh, put on trial, given little to no access to decent defense, and are facing 20-something years in prison. The prosecutor says, you know, agree that you did it, do two years, and then we'll let you out. Or you could go to a trial, and we'll try to put you away for 20 years. And so a lot of people made the choice that, well, at least if I, you know, just admit that I do it, I take the plea deal, then, you know, the worst is that two years and, and I could do that. Uh, but when in reality, they may have not been guilty in the crime in the first place. They just know that they have inadequate defense that generally the, you know, in the case of Israel, the soldiers are believed in the case of the United States, the cops are believed. And I, I guess with I had, maybe she had access to a decent defense attorney. But, you know, when she's facing an Israeli military court, you don't think that the odds are necessarily in her favor that if she goes to trial, justice will be served. Uh, same thing in a U.S. court. So you take the deal and, uh, you know, you're stained with the omission of the guilt. I think this will probably be less of a problem for a head and hopefully she could wear it as, you know, a little bit of a badge of honor. Uh, but in the United States, you know, you, you get tagged with that felony and it just plagues you for the rest of your life. So uh, that's that's just something that really bothers me is the whole idea of a plea deal. I also want to discuss the case of a 2016 murder of a dying man by an Israeli soldier. There was a man who uh, attacked the Israeli defense forces and was neutralized and bleeding out, dying in the street. And an Israeli soldier walked up to him, pointed a gun in his face and pulled the trigger. The man posed no threat uh, to the Israeli soldiers. He wasn't attempting to, uh, you know, get a gun. Um, it, it was clear that, that, you know, that the soldier murdered the man and the man posed no threat to the soldier whatsoever at this point in time. That soldier was put on trial for Israel in Israel. And this was a little bit of a big deal, I think, because there were a lot of people who were appalled that he was even put on trial. The prosecution saw three to five years, uh, for the, for the, you know, murder there. Uh, it, it seemed to me that even that number was a little low, but in the end, he ends up getting 18 months in prison. Within the first couple months, that sentence is reduced to 14 months and then eventually reduced to nine months. And so to look at the, the, just the disparities in justice when a head will do eight months in a prison, uh, a 16, 17 year old girl, and then, you know, a full grown man who's supposed to be trained in one of the finest militaries on the entire planet gets nine months for, you know, murdering a man in cold blood while on the job. That seems to bring us up to date on Ahed's story. You know, hopefully she does okay in jail. One of the things you have to worry about is you've had uh, some people, I believe uh, politicians in Israel are just prominent figures, kind of joke about the idea of turning off the cameras and sending a couple men in there, uh, you know, making these flippant jokes about raping a minor, uh, a 17-year-old girl. You know, absolutely disgusting, but you could imagine that if, you know, she's you know already been, she's a political pr prisoner, uh, plucked from her home in the middle of the night, put through a military prison kangaroo court, eventually agrees to an eight-year plea deal, it's not unreasonable to be concerned that she may face some unfriendly conditions in the jail. Uh, not that that necessarily means she'll be raped, but, you know, possibly beaten or something like that. Subject to unfair conditions, you know, that all those you know, somewhat nasty things, solitary confinement, like, you know, is done in the United States and, you know, as a form of psychological torture. And so th there's just a couple takeaways I want to mention from the story. I guess the first is that uh, a point I believe her father made, and that is, a head is a girl, you know, she's lighter skinned, 
She has blonde hair. She has blue eyes. You know, she's a young girl that's able to stand tall and stand against uh, Israeli, you know, men full grown, you know, with M16s strapped across their chest. And that makes her, uh, you know, a powerful symbol and somebody that people, you know, kind of want to empathize with and want to stand with, you know, but that she really represents the story of the people of Palestine who have faced all of this un- injustice at the hands of the Israeli state and, you know, have their, their lands occupied occupied and you know fully armed soldiers come on your land i mean i i imagine that there's millions of americans and millions of americans who are un you know wavering in their support of israel who would absolutely be appalled if armed u.s soldiers came on their property and told them what to do and i guess the other thing is i think this is just a, a great example of the dis disparity of justice in Israel when you have the soldier who killed the the dying man getting nine months in prison and Ahed getting eight and the last thing I guess I want to mention is just uh, it's an interesting thing with you know this young woman and uh becoming kind of a figure in a uh, symbol of the you know Palestinian resistance to the Israeli occupation and you know hopefully this goes well and uh you know I I always worry when it's a child because, you know, we've seen these situations in Aleppo that uh, there, there's some exploitation going on. Uh, but it does seem that, you know, while this is her family's movement, uh, it's because she has grown up in the Israeli occupation. And, uh, it you know, it's been her life to go to protest and uh, face very strong tear gas uh, from, you know, the, the Israeli government i think one it was either one of the veterans uh from veterans for peace uh who faced the israeli gas talked about how much worse it was than what the united states uses and how the the israeli soldiers pursue the kids around and at times give them uh jail sentences i think that like mandatory minimum is four years for throwing rocks at israeli soldiers all right so that's where i'm gonna wrap up this portion of the show today i hope you enjoyed uh my discussion on ahead there's just a few things i want to talk about from uh, mostly around the rest of the middle east in syria i want to just note that in east gauta uh, one of the neighborhoods there there was a deal reached between arara sham and the Assad government uh, negotiated by Russia for the jihadist forces to move from East Gauta into the Idlib province. And so this will remove uh, another section of the besieged city and I think reduce uh, that number around to 80% or I guess up that number to 80% of the city has been liberated from uh, the, the Syrian rebel control. In Iraq, we eclipsed the 15-year anniversary of Iraq War II beginning uh, this week. I read a lot of good articles on that. I'm going to link to a couple of them in the show notes page. And so for those of you who want you know, take the time to read those, uh, you know, you could do that. But I guess one of the things uh, that, you know, you learn from the history in, the, the, in these articles is that what Iraq War, the Iraq War did by destabilizing and overthrowing Saddam Hussein and then waging a war for the Shia against the Sunni. It created a Sunni insurgency that later grew into ISIS and then eventually took over a large portion of northern Iraq and had to be bombed from existence, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians along the way. And because of that, the, there's so many dead bodies in the Tigris River right now, which, of course, along with the Euphrates, is, you know, the breadbasket of civilization, uh, Mesopotamia, is now, you know, polluted and contaminated because, I guess, of all the uh, decomposing bodies in the water. And so uh, I think this is just kind of a good uh, a good example, like the head story of, you know, what the United States in this case has done to the, the country of Iraq. India, India has also announced that they've identified 39 bodies, uh, that 39 of their workers, I believe, were ca- uh, captured, abducted by ISIS in 2014. They were, I guess, you know, citizens for whatever reason, contracted to work in, uh, Iraq. And, uh, turns out they were dead. So hopefully, you know, this is some closure for those families. Last thing I'm going to talk about on today's show is Afghanistan. The first thing to note is that ISIS-K carried out a suicide attack in Kabul, killing over 30 people. I believe this attack targeted a Shia shrine and, you know, killed worshippers there. 
So right now it seems like the U.S. mission in Afghanistan is to secure the city of Kabul. And I discussed on Patrick McFarland's show how this uh, city had grown from 500,000 to over 5 million during the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. And how this is, you know, created a, a huge problem in attempting to be able to secure the city. And it, it, I think it's showing that right now they're not having much success, if any, in doing that. The last thing I want to talk about on today's show is an Andrew Coburn article published in Harper's Magazine. In that article, Andrew Coburn discusses how the Afghan poppy crop ended up growing so large. Most of you who listen to the show regularly know I recently co-authored an article with Will Porter discussing the implications of the massive uh, poppy crops that have been growing in the Taliban areas. Of course, you know, the poppy is cultivated into opium and then converted into heroin and sold all, you know, all over Afghanistan and regionally and is a huge income for the Taliban. So the Coburn article explains this. And what we have in the Helmand province, which is a pretty heavy Pashtun area of Afghanistan, and one of the Obama policies in Afghanistan was to gain control over the Helmand province and essentially do a coin policy where you secure the area, you provide the people with better ways of life, and then they adopt those ways of life and you could leave and everything will be democracy in America. So one of the problems that the United States had when they move into the Helmand province is a lot of the farmers there farm poppy. And the United States doesn't want the people there farming poppy because that's not part of Western values. And I think even at that time, I'm sure some of the poppy money was going to the Taliban. And so this was seen as uh, cutting off a source of revenue. And so what the Americans do is they provide capital investment to the Afghani farmers. Uh, You know, they, they give them these solar powered pumps that are better than their old diesel pumps because... Uh, you know, once the solar, you made the capital investment on the solar power pump, the thing just runs and pumps water for you. Uh, prior to that, you had the diesel pump, so that means for every hour the machine's on, it's costing you money, it breaks down more often, and, uh, you know, you know, there, there's an expense per gallon of water pumped through. And the United States government provide them with equipment and seeds. And so now you have a situation where the Afghan farmers are able to pump a bunch more water so they could cultivate more land. And the United States is, I'm sure, giving them money and seeds and telling them, here you go, grow wheat. And what do you know? The the poppy farmers stop growing poppy and grow wheat and the helmet poppy, poppy crop and uh, reduces. But then you run to your first set of problems that poppy is a pretty uh, labor intensive crop, meaning that you have to go people go out there and drain the opium sap from the poppy plant uh, in order to get you know your valuable parts of the plant. Whereas wheat, I guess, you know, you're kind of just able to plant it and pick it and, you know, make sure it stays wet enough along the way. And there's really not all that much uh, else to do as far as labor goes. So you have now tons of people out of work. Uh, I I don't think Andrew cites the numbers in his show. He does point out that what all these people do is they go to a different region of Afghanistan. And what you know, they start growing poppy. And the population of that region went from zero to a quarter million. So pretty quickly after you get the people in the Helmand province to stop growing poppy, you now have poppy growing in another region. So, I, I mean, as far as it goes, I don't see how this is really a net positive for the U.S. policy in Afghanistan already. However, the United States as planned, eventually draws down their troops in Afghanistan, and so we slowly withdraw out of these areas. And when we withdraw out of these areas, the farmers say, well, you know, I was making a lot more money growing poppy before, so I'm going to start growing poppy again. And now all these farmers are once again growing poppy. However, they now have increased equipment. Better pumps means they're able to cultivate more land. And so now all these farmers are using the American-made water pumps to uh, you know, grow more crop uh, poppy than ever before. And then you also have the poppy poppy being grown in the other region. So it, it's an absolute failure uh, in every way possible. Every possible goal was absolutely blown up and made worse. And now this money is going to be used to fund uh, Taliban insurgency. So, uh, you know, congratulations, Barack Obama. Your Afghan policy is absolutely blowing up right now in Donald Trump's face. And I guess I shouldn't say that so flippantly because really what's going to happen is that the policy is going to a little bit more literally blow back in the face of American troops and uh, poor Afghani citizens who are the victims of this war. And, you know, it's going to be a brutal and bloody mess. And so I don't want to, you know, diminish this as it's just going to be a political problem for Donald Trump. It's also going to be a massive problem for the people of Afghanistan. 
All right. That's where we wrap up the show to, to for today. Foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, libertarianinstitute.org, immersionnews.com. Best news site around, guys. Check it out. I promise you'll like it. Libertarian Institute on Facebook at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E on Twitter. If you want to support the show, extra foreign po- or patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. And uh, if you do that, you get the bonus podcast. We're going to record one this week and me taking down Matt's boot. So hopefully you guys like it. Hopefully you guys will support the show, share the show, uh, do all those great things, ratings, reviews. Uh, thanks, everyone.